Hmm. All right. Um, All right, so I'll get things going here. Um, Matt Lindblad, all right. Um, all right, so I, I think I kind of lied a little bit. I said at the last meeting that this meeting will be a very quick one uh, to just kind of record votes on this issue, which is straightforward. Uh, and it's turning out that it's not as straightforward as I was anticipating. It also is turning out that um, the type of vote this is, is going to be um, all voting members are going to vote on it. It's uh, basically uh, what has happened is we voted to declassify all of our membership. And so the, the purpose of this meeting is to assign a membership uh, category to all of our members. And so it's appropriate that the, the entire membership, all voting uh, members vote on this. So that's the first thing. Um, so we can either decide a, a little bit later on after some discussion, uh, whether we postpone the vote till tomorrow or whether we just have the vote open. I'll send some reminder emails out about it um, and provide <laughs> its Zoom recording as some background information. Um, I'm sure the ensuing discussion is going to be uh, a good one. Um, so that just kind of, uh, I know some discussions come up through some emails about questions and that's that's great. We need to have these discussion. Uh, it's the first year doing this. So it's naturally there's um, some anticipated things, some unanticipated things have come up and some ambiguous things have come up, which we hope to clarify here. Um, so let's get started. Um, why don't we get started kind of uh, discussing some of the, the criteria. Actually, let's go back. Diana's got a good email, a um, couple good emails here about uh, why are we moving to this classification system? I'm actually going to pass it off to Justin. He, he was more involved with kind of the, the, the background to this. If he can just remind everyone. Um, how this came about and, and what it will provide. And just kind of throw you in there, Justin, I hope you're still on. Mike, I can talk about it if you want. Sure, Zach. He's just right, Diana. So at the ICSA meeting, the league um, voted to institute this system after a committee was put together to look into implementing the recommendations of the consultant that was hired by ICSA. So at the national meeting last year, um, this system was voted in, in place. Thanks, Good. Zach. Thank I, I, I sort of remember hearing that. Um, my concerns are, and I'm, I'm all for making um, the organization as a whole more professional. I think that NISA is the most professional conference uh, in ICSA, but I am concerned as to the impact of smaller developing teams as well as club teams. And as I think everybody here knows, there are more club teams in ICSA than there are varsity teams by a considerable percentage. And so, I'll, I'll just I'll stop there, but I have those are my concerns in terms of the implementation and the impact of that implementation. So Diana, one quick thing is that the committee that um, created this system that was then passed by ICSA had two members that were club teams that helped to make this structure. How many people were on this committee? If it's two of however many and we have a majority that are club teams is that a fair representation 
it was either four, five, or six. I can't remember exactly how many, but it, it was proportionally pretty good representation. Yes. So I want to, I guess I want to point out that this, what we're doing today specifically, um, and whether, you know, whether what came out was accurate or a good representation or not, what we're doing today specifically doesn't change our scheduling. So it's not going to change, you know, today anyway, not going to change what regattas that are on the schedule that club teams are able to participate in that historically they've been participating in. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Taylor. Um, another thing to, to note as well is that this is an annual uh, classification. So, um, you know, every every year that I think there's probably going to be some amount of shuffling from the, the top regional teams kind of meeting a criteria to become cross regional teams. Um, and maybe it works the other way too. Maybe there's some teams that um, they deteriorate a little bit and they, you know, some things happen where they either get no shows or they don't pay their dues or something happens uh, more about their organization and they and they actually lose the status and that, you know, kind of the expectations of their classification. So this isn't a permanent membership by any means. I think the mobility is, a, is an important part of it. A, um, part of it. And I, and I also think I, that- I also uh, think that- Getting some feedback there. Um, that if, if you feel like your classification is not, um, doesn't fall into the category of, of, you know, kind of what you think, then you, you can appeal this and the committees will be happy to, to look over, um, you know, your, your concerns to try to get it right. Um, is Corey on the call? Can she run us through um, the criteria that the committee looked at to make these classifications? Yeah, I think everyone can see the chart we use now, right? Um, so, hi guys. Um, so as you might've seen, um, myself, um, John Mollicone, um, Ken Legler, and Amanda Callahan kind of thought about these. Um, and so I wanted to um, quickly take everyone through a little bit about what these classifications give people, um, because I do think that um, thinking about it instead of just like looking at the list and the classifications is really important. And I think that that is missed a little bit right now. Um, I think that we've been really distracted with some other things and have um, missed kind of what these classifications mean. So I think there's a few key things I want to point out. First of all, I really want to reiterate uh, Kaylin's point about the fact that every year, this is an annual um, like process. So while you don't change it throughout the year, at the end of every year, every November, we're going to look at these lists again um, and see if anyone moves between them. So I think that's really important. The second one I think is also really important that appeals can be brought to the ICSA Executive Committee um, and they should be done uh, in the email it said December 1st was kind of the timeline that they wanted to see those by. So I think that if, um, if you don't agree with your classification after I've talked about it a little bit and after you've talked to us a little bit, you're welcome to go and bring it to the ICSA committee. Um, that's what they said in the email. I think one thing that was missed in the criteria that was outlined is that um, the cross regional is laid out pretty specifically, I think, but those criteria are supposed to waterfall down to the other uh, classifications. So um, kind of like modifying words to fit that cl uh, classification, but those are supposed to waterfall. So when you get to fundamental, there's like no bullet points down there, but that's because the previous um, criteria moves down to those. Um, and then thinking about scheduling, you see this chart here and you can see that um, a conference or fundamental member um, still has access to a few of the different events. So if there's a regional regatta, but you're a conference or fundamental member, then you can, um, if it's in your conference, so if it's in NISA, you can still potentially schedule that event. 
Um, something else I want to remind people is that these classifications change your dues. So a conference level member also pays less than a cross regional member. Um, those are a few things that I wanted to um, reiterate. Um, also just like talking about the criteria we are given. Um, it was talking about demonstrated consistency and continuity, um, looking at competitive strength, um, looking at scheduling commitments, all kind of things that we um, discussed. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Um, hopefully that kind of helped because I think those were a lot of the questions we were seeing in the emails. So I just wanted to make sure that we talked about that before we thought about where everyone fit um, in the uh, uh, in the different classifications. I don't know if Ken or um, John have any extra things that they wanted to talk about. Well, I do, uh, and that, um, the, uh, as Greg pointed out, this is gonna be the hardest year to do this because it's the first year, but it's also hard in another way. There's no 2020 data. And uh, club teams often rise and fall depending on you know, having a nucleus of people that are really psyched and then they graduate and then you, there's an off period and then back on again, but we don't know that for 2020. So we're basing this on 2019 and 2018. And therefore uh, fall of 21, we're gonna have data. And that's when we'll see the biggest changes, uh, much more so than after the fall of 22. So uh, one of the things that we're working out is not just what categories team is in, but what will it take to change categories if a team is motivated to sell bigger events at a conference? Uh, how do they show that in 21 so they can do that in 22? And likewise, if a team stops going regattas in 21, then maybe we had them uh, in, in the wrong category. They should be in the uh, conference category instead of the regional. So. Uh, that therefore, um, Greg is right, it's hard this year, but in more ways than one. So I did just want to clarify one thing I said, kind of like how appeals work. So I did just want to um, reiterate that um, if you like really still disagree after this conversation, um, you can talk to us about it because um, then we submit it and then appeals are December 1st. Maybe that clarifies that a tiny bit. Right, and I think another clarification too is that um, this list is actually only the recommendations from our conference that go to ICSA. They're then gonna vote and use their own um, kind of criteria on, on how they see it. Hopefully we align. Um, they're gonna be looking more at performance base. So they'll just strictly be looking through tech score. Whereas, um, you know, as a conference will be, um, we have, I think we speak more to the operational aspect of it as well as the performance. Um, but there's still a chance that this goes to ICSA and they disagree with um, some of the border cases maybe. Um, and so we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, and there was, um, I think that the criteria is also a little bit ambiguous. Uh, I don't know if I want to bring that up, but why I think it's important is, um, there, there's a couple of cases of, of teams having very strong offshore teams. Uh, and we just wanted to make sure that those teams are, um, Cat, put in the right category where they can continue to pursue those opportunities and continue to, to compete at the appropriate level um, that they have been competing and that their classification doesn't restrict that. So um, it needs a little bit of clarification, but I think that... Uh, so yeah, Mike, that was my, my number one question like for us and Mass Maritime. And there might be, might be an exception there that they declassify the Navy regattas and Cal Maritime stuff as interconference, um, but definitely that I think for at least, and I don't think anyone from Mass is on this call, but that definitely requires some clarification for us. Right. So the intention was to was to we could do it one of two ways. So we can either verify that the, the offshore schedule is 
in to someone's recollection that it was going to be a regional, uh, all of the, the events would be regional events, so it wouldn't preclude you from participating in any of those, or if they were uh, cross-regional to then include you kind of with, you know, with, with, with that cross-regional so that you, you have um, access to those. So we're not 100% sure the best way to like kind of communicate that right now, but that's the intention of the committee was to to give you and, and Mass Maritime the, those opportunities, um, but we just need clarification on, on the best way to do that. Um, it was like Justin has his hand up. Yeah, I do. I think I do. Um, I do think I know. Uh, I, I just wanted to reiterate that, um, like it's been said a couple times, something new and that always uh, increases trepidation. But I really think if people look functionally at the events they've been attending, it, like we look at your schedule from the past two years, and then you look at the events that will be open to you in the in the classification that that um, the committee put you in. I think for the most part, you'll find that you still have access to all of the events that you were sailing before. And it's likely you're gonna pay less money and still have access to all of those events and then have the opportunity to demonstrate um, excellence at that level if you intend to move up, if you think you're misclassified and too low. I, I, I actually, I was excited about this because I think it is a, a better deal for the mid-tier and and fundamental teams, the regional and fundamental teams, with, with maybe a, an exception or two. I think I think it's actually a better deal for most of those teams because they're gonna, for the most part, have access to all the events that were already sailing, and it should be less expensive for them. Thanks for that, Justin. I know Jared. I think you voiced some concerns about that in an email that. Um, you felt that this fundamental membership proposal category for your team wouldn't allow you to compete against, um, you know, basically the the people who you were competing against. So um, I think that that's not not necessarily true. Yeah, that appears to, by and large, not be a huge issue. But I mean, I just didn't. There was no information at that point. I was not sure what the implications were going to be. Right, no, it's fair, fair enough, there wasn't. And, you know, we're, I think um, there were some uh, things that were not really totally anticipated and um, it, it generated some good discussion. We, you know, we met this morning, um, the committee met and some other people met just to kind of talk through all this stuff. And, and it was, I think the main conclusion was that um, it had been a while since this discussion had has happened. So a lot of people either uh, forgot or just never even knew all the details. And then, uh, you know, I didn't do a very good job in communicating what, you know, how this was going to happen and, and certainly didn't give very much time as evidenced by the fact that we certainly do not have the required number of participants to be able to complete the vote today, but uh, we'll leave it open and, um, you know, that'll, that'll happen over time. Um, any other questions or concerns out there that anyone wanted to address? Um, I just have one quick question. And that is, what was the reasoning for the choice of the top 16 as opposed to uh, the top 18, which is what has occurred in the past for a variety of regattas? Uh, I'm going to pass that off to someone on the committee. I, I don't think it was a number so much as um, kind of meeting meeting the criteria, but uh, I'll let someone on the committee kind of. Sure, I'll take it. Yeah, there, there was no uh, a set number, but I can tell you that in Mesa, I believe the number is 13, and it goes sharply down in other conferences. Uh, we're the strongest conference at the top, so we have the most number of teams in. Uh, 18 is the number we have at our championships within NISA, but when we go to interconference events, we're sometimes limited to two teams or four teams or 10 teams. And so having more than 16 would have been a little cumbersome to have all in cross-regional, but it is more than any other conference. 
although there, were, there was no set plan to stop at 16. 16 just seemed like the natural cutoff. Thanks, Ken. Um, so if I understand correctly, this system is an organizational structure that should not impact the ability for any team to move into another classification, number one, and two, it should not impact their ability to schedule within our conference any regatta that they should be eligible for in a normal scheduling year, right? So um, scheduling an event, if you can get into it. So it's not going to hamper, I guess I'm saying it's not gonna hamper the ability. There's not gonna be a cutoff like, oh, we can't have those teams in this event, in conference. I'm not talking about out of conference, I'm talking about in conference. Well, Diana, you're, you're about 99% correct in that um, regional teams can continue to schedule uh, in-conference regattas through the scheduling rank. And, and uh, however, uh, the conference teams uh, will not be able to schedule every event. They can't schedule in-conference, inter-conference regattas as opposed to regional teams, which can. And we often find that the um, uh, the conference teams historically are not going out of conference anyway, and, and they're not tending not to enter the major regattas with NISA anyway. But like I said, there, there, there might be some exclusion that the team didn't want, and if that builds up at all, they should be working to improve their status to get into the next category. And the, and the next category, the next time we do this in the fall of 21, uh, we're not limited to 16 teams that may that number may go down or up uh, because we do expect there'll be some movement after we've had uh, data from 2021. Ken, I, I do what about think Dave, what about Dave White's conference that are cross regionals? How's that going to impact Sacred Heart? Uh, I actually don't know the answer to that because I, obviously I'd like to see our lower Connecticut teams go to the upper Mesa teams, you know, Fordham and, and Sacred Heart are, are pretty a lot closer together than Fordham and, and even Providence. Yeah. But those, so, are gonna be, those are going to be regional events that are open to all regional teams and then fundamental teams from in conference. So if Dave hosts a Sacred Heart invite, uh, any cross regional or regional team, I believe from um, Mesa could attend. <laughs> But we, but you know, he's. We're not going to have uh, to pick on my alma mater, who might likely be a fundamental team. They may not be eligible to come up and sail that, um, sail a, a regional event in our conference. That's kind of how it's designed: is to promote those regional teams from other conferences. You know, uh, having a little more exposure to other to to sailing out of conference. But for fundamental teams, uh, you know, we want them focused on development in conference. And Justin, if you could go a little further, that explains, you know, how Columbia and Fordham could get into a regatta at Sacred Heart. But what about Sacred Heart getting into a regatta at Fordham? Right. And, and Dave, you, you have to remind me, is Sacred Heart a regional team? I believe so. Yes, we are. Yes. we And we typically would attend the Jesuit Open because Fairfield University is a Jesuit university. There's also a uh, collaboration between the two priests who had been for years watching the sailing teams. And there was a little rivalry with Fordham and Fairfield University. And I even received emails about it. So there are other reasons to go down there and go sailing other than just the competition. I'm usually for the separation of church and state, but in this case, that sounds pretty good to me. But uh, right. I, you know, I think, if, I think the Jesuit Open is a good example of an event that will likely be a regional tier event. So it'll be open to regional teams from from other conferences. I think that's how we envision uh, envision that going. I think it, it could also, and Frank, when we did this last time, it could also just not be classified as any of these three, right? When we went through and started to look at our schedule, some were not classified at all, and were open. I think to anybody. Is that? Do you remember that, Frank? Is that wrong? I don't remember that, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. 
Well, if that's if that's true, that would clearly apply to a lot of the offshore events. Greg is shaking his sounds head. Sounds like it doesn't. It sounds like everything has the classification. So, uh, I'd like to go back to Columbia, uh, Justin. Uh, they have come several times to both the Fairfield Cup and the Shoe Trophy uh, for years. So um, we hate to lose them. We've also had New York Maritime quite often because I'm friendly with that coach. They come up and Fordham. So uh, those three teams are almost at every event that we host. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I think it's, you gotta be careful going kind of case by case. Um, I think it's important to see like the 10,000 foot view. Um, I could be wrong, maybe, hopefully Columbia is a regional team. I could be wrong about that. Maybe, they, maybe, um, maybe it's a different fundamental team, but I think what we hope we'll see when, the, when this change happens is that somewhere where we might lose a Columbia at an event like that, maybe we gain a web Institute or um, another regional team then can, can elect, you know, I think in general, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but our, that level of event, uh, Dave, this, the shoe trophy in particular was sort of like the, you know, like you kind of had to know about it and kind of had to ask to get into it sort of, or, um, you know, like from other conferences, like if you were not in New England. And now we think that, well, that event will be on a national regional schedule so that more of the regional teams will know that there's an opportunity there and then we'll hopefully be eager to fill the spots. That's what, that's kind of the direction that I think we are hoping that this um, change will, will, will take us. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, but I, I did promote it heavily within uh, Mesa. By per yeah, I did. I, I sent personal emails to each one of the coaches who I thought would, would send a team. And I, I just remembered we would also have Stony Brook quite often and uh, Webb uh, and Stevens one time even. They, they didn't come, but they talked about coming. So, so yeah, I would call down there because we're so close. We could be to City Island where Columbia and Fordham are uh, – less than an hour it's like 45 minutes so it's much easier uh sure, for yeah, us to yeah. Get there. yeah and i totally understand that and again i think um let's kind of see how it plays out a little take it a year see if the event fills up next year or, in, or in, in, over the next year or two and and if we see that where we have an event like that that's dying on the on the vine when we have other teams that should be there and are and can't because they're fundamental maybe we re, we look more closely at the situation and figure it out. But I, I do think at the 10,000 foot view, I, I'm hopeful that this will create a, an area for events like the shoe trophy and like the um, some of our other kind of more competitive C-level regattas um, and less competitive B-level regattas to gain uh, more teams from around the nation. I think that is ultimately that's the goal is not to like necessarily close people out, but to attract more comparatively competitive teams to those events. I don't, I'm not sure if uh, potentially jeopardizing some of the lower level teams abilities to go to these events is a good thing, given that some of those teams are very tenuous in the first place. If they lose out for a year, I mean, impacts everyone differently, obviously, but that could have more adverse impacts than we want. And I feel like this is having a, a better database of interconference events is something we could have without having additional restrictions on who can and can't go. I would go back to that 10,000 foot view, Jared. Most every NISA club team is gonna have access to almost every regatta they've sailed, nearly every regatta that they've sailed. And I, I think, you know, we're talking about, we, we're involved in like kind of a very case specific and regionally specific scenario with, with um, SHU hosting there, which it, that, that isn't necessarily magnified at the at the NISA level. I think, you know, again, I encourage everybody to go back and look at your schedule from the past year if you're concerned about this. I bet you'll find that, um, you know, 90% at least, probably 95% of the regattas you sailed, you'll still have access to under the new system. I don't know. I haven't done the data, but that would be my guess. I haven't done the, haven't done it myself, but that would be my guess is that that's what you would find. For, for me, for my team, yes, I would agree with that. I was just commenting on this particular situation being that there aren't a huge number of these smaller teams on this call. So I'm just trying to be a, be a voice for that segment of the population. 
Yeah, thanks for that, um, Jared. Um, Mike, can, can we publish the criteria and the process for um, moving between uh, uh, regional to cross-regional and fundamental? Um, yeah, like on the screen right now? No, well, just email it or you know share it in the chat or something. Just because I think there's a lot of people that you know don't know how how it works. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think how it works. Corey touched on it briefly, but uh, once you're in a in a classification, you, you will be in, in November, as she said. <clears throat> you're going to be your your performance at the events that you sailed will be evaluated. If you are beating the majority of, if you're a fundamental member and you're beating all the, you know, the majority of the fundamental members, then um, it, it probably makes sense that you go, you'll probably get voted up to become a regional member. And same thing with regional. If you're, uh, can be the regional member and you seem to be beating the majority of the people uh, most of the time, then you'll probably be pushed up. Now, uh, what do the words like <clears throat> the majority of the time and, you know, that's, I think that's a little bit, um, <laughs> that's where you can't put a number or have a, a something that's totally measurable. And I don't know that anyone knows that yet. I think that's something that we kind of have to see over time, but the spirit of mobility, you know, that will be as, you know, in the system. Um, so people aren't gonna be unfairly pegged in the wrong group. And if they are- Well, it, it well, well I, I think that, that obviously the, the committee is, you know, going to make these recommendations, but we need to add a, a, a step in the process where teams can petition to the committee. That was my question too, Mike. Um, so last we had talked, we talked about voting like we are now on an entire slate of recommendations rather than going one by one by one, um, which makes sense, I think, for sure for this first time around. Is that going to be what the process is moving forward where we will only vote on the slate or like we sometimes do, will we vote on individual teams petitioning to change? Uh, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that we discussed that uh, necessarily, but that probably sounds like what, I mean, it, it's almost the same thing, right? Like of the 16 teams that are cross regional, you know, you're probably gonna look at, you know, generally what's gonna happen, but the shifting would probably only involve a, at most two or three teams in either direction. So I think it's kind of looking at the edge cases uh, and then probably you know in a year from now we'll be voting whether you know certain teams jump make the jump or certain teams need to be brought down um and, and it probably would make sense that it would just be like the individual cases would be voted on I'm, I'm not totally sure but that's something that um we should talk about I know Doug's had his hand up for a while. Doug, I'm sorry to ignore you for so long that the conversation kind of got away. Do, do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, yeah, that, that's okay. Um, what I was gonna say before, um, a while ago, but even more so now is that I understand the cr criteria that was used to um, you know, come up with the categories. And I don't understand, is it fundamental or is it conference? It says two different things on the two different documents there. Uh, that's one, but more so is that uh, it's not really clear you know, we want to try to give incentive to the fundamental regional teams, right, to, to try to move up, right? That's, we're trying to build stuff there. And what's not clear at all, and even by your comments, Mike, with all due respect, is that, you know, what criteria, what, what do they need to do to, you know, enhance their ability to move up to that other before they petition? You know, I mean, I, I just don't think that part of it is very clear through the conversation and what's written here. Uh, maybe I'm missing it, but that's, that's kind of what I thought. I mean, I can touch on that again a little bit. Um, so I think like, in order just in your one thing quickly, Corey, uh, I, I, an important thing is I don't think we want to incentivize anybody to move anywhere. I think we want people to have access to the racing that they really want to be participating in. I think that's a fundamental thing that um, like, you know, I always assume every team wants to improve and get better and move to the next level. But I think a lot of teams in the ICSA as a whole are perfectly happy where they are and, and that they don't really want to move up. So I, Corey, I think it's about to address what the criteria are to move up. And I think that's important, but I, I think it's really key. Not everybody wants to go up. And I think this gives them a system where it's less expensive to participate in the level of competition that they're looking for most of the time. 
Sure, Justin, but that's not going to be everyone. You know, there, there's going to be teams and there's teams on this call already that are questioning kind of where, where, where they are, you know, and I don't think we want to discourage it either. OK, there's many that are going to go in there. I, I would say, to tell you the truth, I would think from this list right here, I would love to see fundamental teams, more fundamental teams, as it's written here, move up to regional. So um, I think there's a few different things. So looking at um, if the if like let's take fundamental, if you are consistently um, beating uh, other fundamental teams, um, and then you prove um, consistent and continuity of leadership um, as well as support. Um, those are things to be considered. Um, I do want to emphasize that I think creating like competition, um, it'll be interesting to see how it is a year. Or I'm more interested in two years because we all know that the next year is not maybe perfect or how we envision it. Um, I'm not sure if that, yeah. that helps From again, um, but yeah, so we're just looking at who's kind of at, who's like beating other fundamental teams. So who's kind of at the top um, there and also looking at their program um, and their scheduling commitments. Um, I'm not sure if, Kaylin, uh, are we hearing a lot of new um, questions um, or I, it sounds like we're looking at specific teams now, so I'm curious about the vote. That's just why, why I have the speaking spot. Are, are we looking at specific teams right now? I, no, so I just, I, um, I'm hearing a lot of the same kind of questions come up. Um, yeah. And so I'm curious um, as we move through this meeting, um, you know, the plan for the remainder of the meeting, because I'm happy to continue discussing it um, but I also know that we have to get, get our list um, approved at some point. I still have two more, more general questions if, if we're moving to more questions. Yeah, we can move. We've got time for discussion. I think it's really important uh, in this first year where there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of concerns that are un, you know, um, unanticipated that we get them all out so that everyone knows what you know, can have things answered and we know what we're talking about. So go, go for it, Jared. Did, or Corey, had, had you finished? Yeah, yeah, I was just reading from the email you gave me. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So Jared, why don't you go ahead? The, the first question I had, um, can we get some data published on what this is actually going to do to the due structure, how this is going to change from what we're looking at currently? We're talking about price is going down, we're not talking about like how much. Uh, I, I mean, I guess that's probably something we email data out on later, but a point I wanted to raise. The other concern that I have and that I have looking at this chart again is the uh, fundamental teams don't have voting rights. And that seems concerning to me in terms of how we might be consolidating the power to make decisions about what we're doing. Uh, I think on the cost, Jared, there hasn't been anything published uh, from ICSA or from anyone else. It, the discussions that have happened about cost, my understanding recollection was um, that cross-regional members were going to be um, paying for the, the bulk of everything. So I, I, think, I think it's roughly something like a thousand dollars for cross regional, five hundred for regional, and one hundred and fifty or two hundred for for um, fundamental. Is is that about right, Justin? And again, that, that's just a guess from the conversations that I've heard that are a little bit hand wavy and wishy washy. Yeah, I, I I don't remember exactly. Greg might have a better idea, Mike. Okay. Um, and your and your concern about the ICSA voting. Um, it looks like Greg has his hand up. So why don't we have him maybe answer that yeah. one? Okay. So the um, so it's important to note on that slide that the voting has to do with ICSA voting, not with NISA voting. Um, and the only people who hold votes in ICSA are board members. 
And um, this is largely just a, basically a clarification of kind of where we're already at in that um, the intent is that regional or cross regional members should hold board seats in ICSA and um, uh, rather than fundamental members where fundamental is the initial, you know, the initial joining point and um, Maybe it's like you know, the, you know, I mean, it's smoky competition smoky. level of competition goes up from there. So these are as much as it says ICSA voting, it really should be eligibility for ICSA board seats because the only votes in ICSA um, are to board members. It has no impact on MISA voting. Thanks for that clarification, Greg. Um, did my cost sound about right from what, like that was the recollection I have, Greg. Yeah, the cost, uh, the intention is for cross regional to be at least double, double what regional is and for fundamental to be a nominal membership fee, but all, all dues stuff is basically on hold uh, along with major increases, any major increases in spending due to the ICSA, like executive order related to COVID. Okay, thank you. Um, hey, Diana, did you get all of your, I know you had a couple of questions, were they answered the, the way you wanted them answered? Did you get all your clarifications? Yeah, I think so. I, uh, I always am concerned about those teams that don't necessarily um, rise up to the level that, um, you know, I, I, I just want to ensure that everybody continues to have, I can't, okay, thank you. I just need to make sure that everybody still has opportunities and that it doesn't become divisive in that uh, those teams that are fundamental never have an opportunity to play against other teams to improve their, you know, their strengths, right? If you stay within your own group, you play within your own group, your skills really don't change that much. If you're constantly, and nobody wants to be at the bottom of the fleet, but if you're, if you play with uh, more skilled teams or the bigger boys and girls, so to speak, your, you, your skills eventually improve, right? It's not beginner sailing. Any, it's, you're, you're providing other opportunities. So my point is that I want to ensure that every team, regardless of where they fit on this, continues to have the opportunity to continue to develop and to play against stronger teams so that they continue to develop and grow in both strength and depth. And that people going to their schools go, yeah, I want to go and sail at my at this school and know that they're, you know, the competition is going to be uh, equitable. Mike, can I jump in for a sec to yeah. Help with Diana's concern. Sure. Um, so Diana, I just want to make sure that um, your legitimate concern gets a really, really transparent and honest and objective answer. So um, access to competition for all will remain at the regional, at the regional level. It's unlimited access within NISA. Unlimited. Fundamental teams can compete in a NISA regional regatta. Cross-regional teams can compete in a NISA regional regatta. Regional teams can compete in a NISA regional regatta. Like unrestricted, full-blown access. But this system does have restrictions in place that did not exist before. So just to just to be totally, okay, it's really important that everybody understand the system. And the other thing I think is important to understand um, this is kind of like a workshop type call. This system exists, it's in the bylaws of the ICSA. It got passed by three quarters of the board last May. This exists, it's done. But um, to so that everyone understands how it's going to work, there are restrictions at the cross-regional level as you saw on the slide. In cross-regional regattas, and there won't be a ton of them, but in all cross-regional regattas, everywhere in the country, there can only be cross-regional teams. That's how this is set up. And then there's, a, there's a, another restriction. Outside of New England, um, 
fundamental teams are um, fundamental teams are not going to travel out of their conference to compete in regional events. So those are you asked about restricted access to competition. There is some, and I just want to make sure I want to be really clear what the restrictions are. But there there are some restrictions to competition. There's also places where there's universal access to competition. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. Uh, then that begs the question, although I don't think it would happen. Let's say within NISA, there is a cross-regional regatta and there are open spots, right? Where for whatever reason, there's an open spot and it goes to NISA before, let's say it goes to NISA before it goes to outside of NISA. Does that open the opportunity for a team that is not categorized as cross-regional to say, hey, we'd like to come and based on our ranking within NISA, we feel, you know, and on our wait list, we'd like that spot. I think that uh, I, my gut feeling is that the answer, the way it's written is no, but um, like any like detailed issues with a new system, I think it's a valid question that should get floated and I'll make sure it does. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, yeah, Greg, I, I think I was trying to think about how that rule is written. I think the way in conference interconference events are written is that if that birth goes back to NISA, NISA gets to decide how it gets disseminated right now. Uh, I don't think that was changed, but that is a good follow up because if that's still true, and then also we are only allowing cross regional teams to do those, then those two are kind of at odds. Um, definitely worth follow up. Writing it up now. Do you suppose before we vote, Mike, that it would behoove us to have um, all those particulars that have come up today and all the extra information that you and Greg um, and, and others have shared that it kind of be written up and pretty clearly spelled out so that the members that are not able to be here, seeing as it's supposed to be uh, voting from the entire membership and having giving people the opportunity to do so, uh, gives people an opportunity to read and think and uh, before they say yay or nay. I'm not saying that I'm gonna say one way or the other, but I just wanna make sure that people, A, that are not on this call, that haven't had the benefit of hearing the discussion that don't really that are going to bring the same questions up when they go like holy mackerel holy tomato paste what the heck is this that they have all those details i realized some of this information was on a zoom call last year last year feels like a millennium ago to be honest um and although this may or may not pass and as greg said this is already a done deal i think it's only fair to the membership that everybody have the information before they uh, sign on the dotted line. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so a couple things on that. Um, yeah, I think having more information is certainly valuable. Uh, we'll do our best to get get every all the concerns that have been brought up um, answered in some type of Q&A. Um, the Zoom recording will also be made available, but I understand people might not have an hour to, to go through it. Um, we're also, you know, I, I wish it weren't this way, but we are we ha do have a bit of a, a deadline coming up. Um, so I don't know what, <laughs> Diana, what would happen if this doesn't didn't pass? If if uh, a lot enough of the team said, you know, I'm not comfortable with this, what would be the way forward at that point? Oh, you know, that's a really great question. I, I, I don't have the answer. I think I'm going to go back to what Justin said, and that is taking the 10,000 foot view, I think is important. But I think fleshing out the details that people have shared today and have kind of addressed some of the concerns and questions helps 
helps clarify it. Um, it certainly gives me a clear path, right? Um, and I just want to make sure, I always want to make sure that those people that for whatever reason could not attend this meeting have an opportunity to, to see and to hear and to understand what it is that's going to happen and um, just to preclude difficulties in the future. That's all I'm saying. No, it's, I, I, I understand that. that um, you know, this year is a bit of a, a leap of faith, I would say, uh, in that there are probably still, even after we answer a bunch of these, or, you know, we kind of go through this exercise, there's probably still things that will pop up in the future that were just couldn't have been anticipated. So, um, you know, that's, that's a par part of it, I think. But uh, certainly getting everything that we know about out to people, um, and if it helps them, that's, that's good. Uh, I'll try to divvy up really quickly after the call, um, you know, quickly assign out some categories that we discussed and have people write up a small uh, section of it and then um, email that out with the link to the vote. Does that sound fair? I mean, does that sound like a good, good, okay. Sure, but can I ask a question? Um, we're really just voting on how, how we're breaking teams down, right? Like we're not voting on this system because it's already been passed by ICSA, it's happening. So we're really just voting on how we're breaking teams down, right? That's correct, yeah. And um, the ICSA committee, if they feel like it, if they don't like the way we broke it down, they're gonna change it anyway. So I wonder um, how much is actually gonna change by disseminating information. Can I ask anyone who knows, when, when we were at the winter meeting and in May, that question was brought up about how much adjustment the ICSA level was going to make on the conference recommendations. And the answer that we got was that, you know, their goal is to accept the slate of recommendations from the conference as received because conferences know better than the ICSA does about individual teams. Is that, has that changed or is it still? That's, them? that's, that's very true on the operational excellence side of things. I believe that, I believe that the ICSA competition committee is relying very heavily on the conferences to um, determine the operational excellence. We just have better access. We've got the bookkeeper, the treasurer, scheduling rank, everything else. But um, competition Strength of competition has to be level set on a national field. So, so we we're we're level setting on a conference basis, and then they need to level set our data on the national level, and they've got access to all the, they've got access to everything. So there could be some adjustments. Um. Yeah, and I, I was just thinking about Diana's thing is we, we, you know, I think the group that met this morning to discuss all the, the questions and stuff, we all agree that there's not sufficient information uh, and that I didn't provide it in the email and that, you know, that since I couldn't have anticipated all these things coming up just from where, you know, my viewpoint of, of scheduling and everything. So, um, you know, it's certainly valid. And I think that this is the bumpiest and the, and the most difficult year to, to get it all right. Uh, but to Zach's point, it's not, we're not voting on the system. You can't abstain from voting or, you know, disagree with this because you don't like the system because it's, it, it is what it is. It's, um, we, we do have to move forward and we can't, we can't use this. This isn't a referendum on the system that was voted on. We're just assigning the classification and do remember that there is, um, some, <laughs> there is mobility. It's not a, a death sentence. It's not a permanent thing. Um, so, so keep that in mind as well. I think those are important parts too. Um, it's not uh, Mike, and you're giving, and we're giving teams a week to appeal now if they feel like it's incorrect. That's true too. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. You know, the committee's willing to to hear people out, and maybe they've missed something, uh, or they're they're unaware of something. So, you know, it's it's. This is a pretty transparent and what we think is a fair process. I don't, I, we, we, we're gonna work to get the information out so that it is more transparent. I know it's all in the heads of the people in the committee and, and all in, in our heads, but to the people that are gonna open up their email and look at this stuff, 
um, they're going to need a little bit of guidance, a little bit of reassurance on what it is they're voting for and, and why they're voting. And um, I think also a reminder, as Zach points out, it's not a referendum on something that has already been decided. It's we're, we're just trying to do our part as a conference to get the, the, the uh, our schools categorized so that scheduling can move forward for the next year. So can you remind me of the timeline that this has to be done by? Do, is it due to the ICSA by December 1 or is it due to the ICSA earlier? So ICSA wants this uh, November 15th. Um, and I didn't follow this stuff about appeals. What I think Corey was, uh, she was referencing the December 1st date for appeals. But I think we would want to, um, I think we'd want to sort our appeals out. Um, is there a penalty to getting it to them before December 1? Like, we, I think, yes. Okay. Yes, it's due November 15th and they will have it done by December 1. So we're like, we give them a list. And again, they need to confirm the list. They will have that done by December 1. For appeals on our end, do we need to have that wrapped up by November 15th then? Yes, they want a list by November 15th of what NISA thinks each NISA members, they, they want a, a conference confirmed list that MIT is applying as an X category member. Okay, so in that in the email that, that we'll send out, it, it will also include um, deadlines for appeal, which will be a pretty quick turnaround. It'll be like, you know, get your appeal in by tomorrow at noon or something like that. So we can get it out the door by later tomorrow. All right, any, any other questions or concerns or things we should talk about before signing off? So Mike, this, is getting voted on and i i hope that it doesn't have issues but what happens if in the very real possibility that we do not have a a quorum or b um a yes vote on this does it matter at all or does does the icsa just do what they want to do at that point i don't know it's a great question um because it sounds I, like you have three days it's a constitutional crisis baby i like I, it i i, I know we're a membership organization. We're required by our bylaws to fit into a membership category. And so if we have to vote every school one at a time, we will classify every single school one at a time. And if we're unable to classify a school, then I guess they won't be a member of NISA, but we will be able to classify a school because we have three choices to pick from. And so we will vote and then everyone will be classified as a member. And then ICSA will confirm them. So we can do it 30 at a time, or we can do it on the slate. We can do it either way. So hopefully it doesn't get to that. Um, hopefully people, um, I think people, if they're objecting, they're thinking about their own particular situation. And then they're, they, they just quickly follow up with an appeals process. And then hopefully it's just a matter of not understanding how everything's going to work. And uh, they'll get some clarification and then they'll be fine. All right. Well, thank you all for your time. Appreciate it. I will uh, work hard to get that out to you as soon as I can. Hey, Mike and Frank, is the next meeting the uh, winter meeting? And is, if, if so, is that going to be the first Saturday in December still? Yeah, that's, that's the plan. Yep. Mike, another question. When do we have to enter our vote by on this sheet? Mm. I'm going to arbitrarily say noon tomorrow. I don't know why I say that. I think I mentioned it once in an email, but um, it jives with the, uh, unless there's some rule on that. Is there a rule on that, Frank? 
I, I don't I don't think so. I don't think. Or maybe it said 10 o'clock tonight, actually. But all, all things considered, if people are reading the stuff tonight and they want to mull it over, maybe by uh, noon tomorrow is appropriate. And then make that a, an appeals deadline. And then hopefully we can wrap it up by tomorrow afternoon. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.